coming back. Thanks for joining us if it's your first day. Uh, the topic that Mana's going to be covering this morning, mobile robots, one of the next technologies that will really change how we automate our facilities. And you know, where collaborative robots were about five years ago, mobile robots is, is right there. So there's a lot of interest. People are trying to figure out the best uses. There is a race uh, to the top in terms of who's going to be the major players. And frankly, there's a lot of good players out there right now. Uh, so uh, the concepts that Mon's going to be going about, going over, and it's going to be high level as well as some of the details, but uh, hopefully you'll get a, get a feel for what is possible and over the next 10 years, some of the major changes that we'll see on how we deliver parts in our facility, how we uh, reduce the number of steps that people are having to take on a daily basis, everything from moving high value parts to taking out the trash. So uh, it's really a, a fun discussion and uh, you know, for the folks that are involved in the logistics of your facilities, it can be a real eye opener. Uh, before we get rolling, um, I'm going to make a quick announcement. Uh, hopefully everyone's going to be able to hang around this evening for the festivities. We've got a lot in store. That's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of good food. Uh, but as part of it, we will be having a cornhole tournament. Uh, it's not required, but this is going to be a fundraiser for Hurricane Florence Relief uh, through United Way and Red Cross. If you would like to, to donate, uh, please do so. We'll point out who to get those donations to this evening. But if you just want to play in the cornhole tournament as well, uh, please sign up and we'll be forming two-man teams. Josh Westmoreland will be the uh, master of the game and Josh is a lot of fun. So uh, you know, regardless of, uh, of your skill level, it promises to be a, be a good time. So go ahead and start that. Mana, hope you all have a great day. If there's anything that we can do to help out, please let us know. Would you mind uh, grabbing Dale? Dale? Okay. Awesome. That's, is that too loud? Is that better? Can you guys still hear me? Sweet. All right. So, um, I don't really have a clever way to lead into this. Um, I think Andy did a pretty good job summarizing, uh, giving a brief intro of what we'll be talking about. So, we'll just get right into it. Uh, can mobile robots help your bottom line? Right? So, how are we going to go about this? Uh, we're going to go over what is a mobile robot, uh, how they differ from traditional AGVs, uh, things to consider if you're going to deploy multiple throughout your facility. Uh, we're going to look at some case studies and examples, and finally, are they right for you? Now, I'll, I'll preface this by saying this, when you look at a physical, like a robot arm, you see one moving, you see maybe a demo in front of you, and you can immediately kind of visualize what it can do for you, right? You imagine in your head, okay, I have a person doing this all day. It's dull, dirty, dangerous, whatever. I can just do that task with a robot. Mobile robots are a little bit more complex. So with the preface that you may not be able to immediately visualize what a full deployment looks like in your facility with a fleet, that's totally fine. It always takes kind of a deeper dive. Um, so, what is a MOBOT? Um, it's not necessarily an industry-wide term, but we call collaborative robots COBOT, so maybe I call it that. Maybe we'll catch on. Um, so what is it? Uh, they're called several things. Uh, mobile robots are called autonomous intelligent vehicles, AIVs, uh, AMRs, autonomous mobile robot, intelligent guided vehicles. Um, they're all kind of synonymous and interchangeable. The key feature is that, they, wow, those colors don't show up as well as I thought. Anyway, that says the ability to detect obstacles and find alternate routes when needed and without intervention. Does that make sense? Um, this is what a typical one might look like. Uh, you've got the robot itself. It's got onboard navigation, path planning, intelligence, Onboard safety systems, it's got battery and sensor management, obviously power management is a big deal with, with these. Uh, the application payload, it can be active or passive. Um, what's an example of a passive application payload? Don't overthink it. I'm sorry? 
Yes, perfect. Uh, passive payload is you just put something on top. Uh, it will, it's some kind of fixture or structure that lets you just put a, a bit of cargo or whatever you're moving uh, on top of the robot. What's an example of an active payload? A robot. I'm sorry? A robot. It can be. Um, that gets a little more complex as far as deployment goes. Uh, the typical example would be if you had a powered conveyor or something on top of the robot. So you not only put a bin, but your robot can dock to an existing conveyor system and actually shovel the load off the top of the robot. Uh, and then, you've got, of course, you've got your cargo. Uh, probably one of the main reasons you would have this robot in the first place. Totes, boxes, product, uh, whatever you're actually moving uh, from point A to point Z. Um, so some examples of what that application payload is. These, these three over here are kind of custom built. Uh, for the most part, they're active payloads. Uh, that over there is just the, is the cart option that comes with the Omron LB mobile robot unit. Uh, this one over here, this is actually sort of a hybrid, uh, those two, because they're they're only carrying totes. There's no powered conveyors or anything, but they've got these operator stations kind of built into the mobile robot. So the, the, the mobot rolls up somewhere where an operator is, and the operator can actually input things or send commands. Um, same thing with this one. This one's kind of cool because it, it has a powered conveyor, but also a, a gate that secures the cargo as it moves throughout the facility. That would be for high value work in process componentry or something. Uh, mobile robots versus AGVs. Everyone know what, is an, what an AGV is? Um, they're, they're pretty ubiquitous in large manufacturing. Um, so what's, what's the actual difference? Which one of the, well, you, you know that's a mobile robot already, uh, but that's an AGV. What do you see here that you don't see there? Exactly. Um, so they're, they're similar in that they both move stuff, whatever that is, from point A to point B. Uh, and they can safely operate alongside people. You can also have a fleet of both of them, right? AGVs, it's rare to go into a facility and see like one AGV running around. Usually there's all sorts of things happening and really complex like metro systems of, of tape on the floor. Uh, but they're different in a lot of ways. The main thing is that the mobile robot does not need any kind of physical infrastructure to actually move around the facility. So you program it from a central place, but it, programming means you say, okay, this task is you come here at point A, stay there until the operator loads the cargo and says go, and then you go to point B and you wait until the operator unloads stuff and hit go. That's an example of a really simple mobile robot application, right? You can do that with an AGV. The only difference is an AGV relies on tape on the floor and if something comes in front of it, it has to stop until that's, that goes away, right? Consequently, what does that mean? If there's other AGVs behind it, if the path is obstructed, this one stops and it also stops every other one behind it. So basically your entire supply movement stops, right? Or if a battery dies or something. Mobile robots, something's in front of it, someone puts a pallet or a cart on the floor where the AGV or the, the mobile robot moves around, It'll find a path around it, and it doesn't need to communicate with a central, uh, like a brain, to help it find a path around. All that navigation and path planning is done right there on the robot, right? So that makes them extremely flexible. Uh, the only infrastructure you need for a mobile robot uh, is Wi-Fi, right? So it communicates over Wi-Fi. So you need to make sure you have Wi-Fi coverage and all that's in place. There's also options where you can put a camera, Omron calls it the acuity system, but basically what it is is an upward facing camera and it actually makes a map of all the overhead lights in your facility and uses that to figure out where it is for, for overall path planning purposes. Um, obstacle handling, I kind of covered that. Uh, Mobot can find its way around, AGVs have to stop. Scalability, so if you have this system of AGVs with you know, buried wires or tape or, or whatever, and all of a sudden you need to scale up or reconfigure how everything's done. Which one do you think might be easier? With a mobile robot or an AGV? 
Right, so you do that all from one place. You don't need to rip up wires from the floor or put down new tape. And it's not just putting down the tape, but it's also debugging kind of the paths that you've set up, right? So a mobile robot, you can do that all from one place. In AGV, you have to do all these massive changes throughout your facility. Charging, the mobile robots generally, you can program how they charge themselves. So there's these docking stations that they use as kind of landmarks, but also to refill the battery, right? So a mobile robot can intelligently go find a docking station and charge itself, whereas an AGV, you need to schedule the charge or you know, trickle charge at each station. And then again, if you run into a battery problem, your whole line stops with an AGV until someone comes and moves it out of the way, right? Uh, human robot collaboration. So like I said, both of them, AGVs, almost all the time they'll have a laser scanner and some sort of physical bumper, right? And the mobile robot has the same thing. The only difference is the mobile robot is pretty well adapted to environments where the human traffic is unpredictable. Right, so if you're in a facility with an AGV and an AGV is coming by, a person doesn't really want to cross in front of it, right, because they'll stop the whole line. Mobile robot, it doesn't really matter. It can navigate down these hallways with people traffic. Um, this also comes into, an effect, into effect if you have like a shipping and receiving area in, in your facility and the floor plan changes a lot. Right? Because you get different shipments, you put pallets out on the floor. It's not like you have this room with a bunch of workstations and the layout never changes. Shipping and receiving area, your layout's changing almost every day. Right? So that type of human-robot collaboration is also pretty well suited for mobile robots. Moving material in a nutshell, um, manual movement, push carts, forklifts. It's kind of like the chaos of a crowded sidewalk. Right? AGVs, conveyors, they're a little better. They add a little more structure to material movement, uh, but they're still on a prescribed schedule. Uh, a train can never leave its tracks, right? A bus will always stay on the same route. Mobile robots are more like taxis, right? Taxis go physically wherever they're needed, to wherever they're needed, right? So there's a lot of flexibility, but still organization like with a taxi system. Uh, fleeting thoughts. Uh, so now we're gonna get into using multiple mobile robots in the facility. If you have one mobile robot, that's awesome, right? You've basically freed up a certain amount of material movement done by people. If you have two mobile robots, that's even better. Now you can do twice as many tasks at one time. But it's not just that they need to be doing tasks at the same time. That that programming needs to be coordinated, right? Individual robots can be tied to specific jobs. So you could say this one robot is only gonna do this task here, this other robot's only gonna do this task here. What happens if something in your facility changes and now their working areas need to overlap? Everything just got a lot more complicated, right? Because without something tying all of them together, they're always gonna trip over each other. Uh, what happens if one robot needs repairs, right? Now you have one task that's still automated, but this entire section of your Mobot fleet is out of, out of service and nothing is doing those tasks. So really with multiple mobile robots, the true power is unlocked with fleet management software. Um, I will say, if you, <laughs> there is a situation where you might be able to implement multiple robots without fleet manage management software, and that's if their work areas never ever overlap. If you get any more complex than that, fleet management software is the way to go. Um, like it says, it gives you autonomous, dynamic transport of goods and on-demand flexibility. Um, it centralizes a lot of things. Uh, job dispatch and management, configuration management, so how is each robot actually configured? You can push new configurations from one place. Uh, traffic flow optimization, which is kind of cool. If you have two mobile robots approaching each other at the end of the hallway, do you want them to meet in the middle and then kind of do that? Let me give you an example. Have you ever been on a sidewalk and someone's coming the other way and you do this little dance where you're like, what? All right, you're going, and then it takes, a minute to 
get both of you coordinated. Traffic flow optimization prevents that, basically. So if you have two mobile robots coming the other way, you can say, all right, this mobile robot, when you're going this way, stay to this side. When you're going that way, stay to that side. It, it sees that happening uh, during the execution and optimizes it. You can control up to 100 mobile robots with fleet, with fleet management software. The best analogy um, would be like a foreman. Not that type of foreman, more like a construction foreman. Um, on a construction site, jobs are being carried out, right? But it's not like everyone's just seeing a job that, you know, picks up a hammer and starts putting in nails. There's someone coordinating, right? All right, you're doing that task. When you're done with that, I need you to do this. Oh, well, that's taking longer than expected, so I need you to go do that task B or whatever, right? Fleet management software streamlines all that with a mobile robot. Because like I said, a facility is not just one process. All sorts of things, you're gonna run into all sorts of variables, uh, even over the course of one day at a facility, right, with the, with the movement of goods. So the key system features of fleet management software, it allows you the ability to interface with operators. What does that mean? If you need a call button somewhere, right, if you need Say you have a station, and when the operator's done with their task, they call a mobile robot to offload the goods uh, onto a robot so it can carry on. Which robot needs to go there? Well, whichever one's free, whichever one doesn't have other critical tasks coming up ahead, right? So the fleet management software actually thinks five steps ahead, right? So it looks at what's being done now, what are the next four things I need to do, or five steps ahead. So what are the next five things I need to do and which robot should I send over here? Well, this robot's free, but its battery's getting kind of low. So I'm not gonna send that one. I'm gonna send this other one that is just about to finish a job and then will be free and has a full battery, right? You guys ever use Bird? Those uh, little electric scooters? Um, how, do you, how do you pick a Bird? You gotta... You can find the closest one. But you gotta think a couple steps ahead, right? Because someone else might have snagged it by the time you get there. Because you have to actually scan a code when you, I'm going on a little bit of tangent, but I think this is a good example. You have to take into account how many people you have in your party, because you don't want to be like, all right, got my scooter piece, you know, right off. Uh, so you actually have to think a couple steps ahead, even when it's a person trying to get one of these scooters that are in high demand. So fleet management software kind of thinks about all those steps that are happening in your program and picks the best mobile robot at any given moment and dispatches it to a job. Uh, it can integrate with WMS and related IT systems. ERP systems, it can communicate the flow of goods uh, during WIP uh, into your ERP. It does queue management, like I said, and fleet management, obviously. Um, that's kind of the structure of how it's set up. I'm not really gonna go into it because I don't think it's super applicable right here, uh, but I'd be happy to share that more with you later. Um, so how big of a fleet do you need? Obviously that gets very complex. Um, it's not necessarily as simple. Like I said, when your work areas overlap, it's not as simple as I need one robot here and one robot there, right? You might, you might not need five robots necessarily. Four might be the magic number. Uh, it's still an investment, right? So you don't wanna, you don't wanna throw too much money at this investment but you also want to make sure it's effective, right? So the best way to do that is to gather preliminary information. That's, that's the case with any large project, right? Number two is spreadsheet it. Put in all your, basically make a model of your material movement needs. Um, wow, I skipped some stuff. Gather preliminary information means environmental, right? So what does your working environment look like? Uh, where are your tools and your actual goods located, uh, your throughput, material transfer data, uh, process details, what's your material, what's your payload weight, what's your, what timing do you need for your processes, all sorts of stuff. Every application's a little bit different. This is just kind of high level stuff to talk about. Spreadsheeting looks like that. There's, we're not gonna talk about it. it it's just too detailed. Um, and then a simulation actually let you see what this fleet of robots would look like in your facility. Uh, this is obviously very complex. It's not something that 
you would want to just sit down and do yourself. Um, but this is something, this is a service that Omron provides that really helps you narrow down uh, the scope of your mobile robot deployment. And I do confess, I kind of like the MOBOT specifically for the pun in this slide, that term MOBOT, so um, full disclosure there. So here's some examples. Uh, this is the milk run example. So a milk run basically is, think about what the, an old school milkman used to do, right? He would go to specific places, wherever his customers are, he would drop off full bottles of milk and pick up the empties, so to speak. Right? So in manufacturing, this means line side replenishment. Where is the work being done? Bring them new material, right? Uh, bring them kits for assembly, order fulfillment, uh, running out the orders, putting away goods that need to be put away. This eliminates low value add tasks, right? So people touching and moving material doesn't add value to a process, right? Um, errors in selecting carts or destinations, it happens to the best of people, right? It's not laziness, uh, it's human nature. People make mistakes at some point or another. Late deliveries, everyone's run into this, um, and employee delays and distractions. Again, just out of human nature, this happens. It also allows traceability in the movement of goods. So if you've got this system set up with mobile robots, you can actually track where your goods are any given process. Uh, this particular example here, you can see the guy up top loading up a cart with boxes, and he doesn't need to do any more of that. So he's actually minimized how much he handles these goods, right? And then a mobile robot with the cart option is dispatched there. It docks to the cart, right? So it mechanically locks itself to the cart, and then in the bottom picture you see it bringing, it, bringing its cargo to its destination, leaving the cart there, and then moving away to do other tasks. Kidding and delivery, this is a long video, but I think most of it is worth it. Uh, this is kidding for food trays uh, with the delivery process being done to the final assembly areas. This particular application actually, it happened in a two shift plant, so it actually replaced two people. Um, and this was, a, this was a simple cart pushing operation. Um, and again, it eliminates a lot of the same things, but what's new in this one is You'll see in the video as it makes, it makes its way down this hallway, there's a large amount of carts uh, right next to assembly areas, right by the walkway, and this drastically reduces the number of carts uh, that need to be there. Because really they've converted from batch processing to just-in-time fulfillment, right? Batch processing, there's always gonna be a little bit of error in what size batches you push to the next step in assembly, right? You're gonna to have too much material. It makes it very hard to plan. Um, if anyone's heard of the beer game, uh, where you need to kind of simulate a supply chain and, and uh, order so many cases of beer upstream, uh, this reduces, this streamlines that process greatly by allowing the operators to call for exactly as much material as they need. And again, it allows traceability and movement of goods. Check out the work area there. So you see how there's carts, the, I feel like putting a cart diagonally in the middle of a walkway is not the intended placement uh, on a manufacturing floor, but everyone's situation's a little different, this robot can handle it, right? So it makes its way around, there's human traffic. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted you guys to see basically. The rest of it's just putting the cargo down. Bus route pickup, so this is slightly different from the milk run. The milk run, the robot goes only where it's needed for a drop off and pickup, right? The bus route is, it follows the same stops during every, this is kind of, it's, it's running a circuit and it's stopping at the same places every time. What's unique about this versus an AGV, well, number one, obviously you don't need the tape and the physical infrastructure, but this one's actually going right up to cubes. Um, and the operator here can tell the robot to wait. Hang on, I've got some more stuff to put on. Uh, this was actually a jewelry manufacturer. Again, a two-shift operation. Um, eliminates all the standard kind of things. Traceability and control is important here, though, right? Because if they're making jewelry, they're 
work in process is actually pretty valuable and you don't want anyone just pocketing it because it may be made of gold or silver or whatever. So in this case, a mobile robot not only freed up a person from having to push carts around, um, but also lets you trace where all your work in process goods are. Um, and obviously it's right at home in tight corridors in a, in a cubicle area or whatever. This one has a pretty sophisticated custom uh, operator interface. That was a screenshot from the programming system. You can track the position of all the, all, all the mobile robots. She's telling it to wait there. So this one's pretty self-explanatory, but this is, I think, a really good example of a not only an active payload, but a pretty complex one. Can anyone see what's complex about it? I'm sorry? Two direction travel on the robot. You can roll and swap. Yes, well, I don't think we see it, see the product being offloaded either way, but that conveyor can move stuff on and move stuff off, but also it can shuttle a bin from one side to the other. Uh, I think you see a. Uh, it showed. Yeah, so it showed it a couple seconds ago. Um, so this is, a, this is an example of inventory pickup. And this, this system, okay, so the other nice thing about this, you're it's basically shuttling product from one conveyor to another, right? But with the mobile robot, it doesn't matter where those conveyors are, because you no longer need to link those conveyors with another conveyor. So you have a lot more flexibility in not only the current layout of your plant, but also how do you want your conveyors to be laid out six months from now? Does that need to change? Well, you don't need to reconfigure a whole bunch of conveyors. You can put each of those processes where it makes sense in the big picture, knowing that a mobile robot, you can just change the path and still get goods from one to the other. Uh, which is basically this concept right here. Um, you're not any longer constrained by your floor plan when you're figuring out all your different processes, right? So you can turn a mobile robot basically into a mobile conveyor. Um, without that, you would need to keep all these processes in line, right? All those particular, they're clearly modular, but with standard conveyors, they all need to be physically right next to each other. You can only build in one direction, and if you run out of space on one side because you have a wall or reach the end of your floor space, you need to move that entire line to make room for it or add a conveyor system and, and kind of still have that problem down the line. So the mobile robot, it doesn't matter really in a modular system like this where each cell is because the mobile ro the mobot can, is flexible enough to accommodate it. So are they right for you now that, now that we've talked about it? Um, Six Sigma, I'm not a Six Sigma expert, but I do know there's eight deadly wastes that are classified, right? Mobile robots actually address or eliminate five of those eight deadly wastes, right? So defects, um, it doesn't eliminate defects, but it allows much greater traceability over defects, right? Weighting, automated material flow optimizes the movement of width. So if you have a fruit manager, that fleet manager optimizes when a mobile robot needs to be here. It's, not, it's no longer just queuing up tasks for a robot or for a person or whatever. It's actually doing optimization. When is the best time for a mo to send which mobile robot to get this task done? Non-utilized talent, obviously if you have people pushing carts from point A to point B, that's not a high skill or a high value task and people are much better suited to higher value tasks than pushing a cart, right? So by automating that process, you can redeploy that labor to higher value add tasks. Transportation, obviously, touching, touching something and just moving it never adds value. Um, to, and this is from a process side, not from what people are good at side. Uh, but if your movement happens with a robot, you're reducing the non-value add touch from a person. Right? 
unnecessary movement. Obviously, if a robot's doing it, the person doesn't need to push a cart and move all the way around the facility. Uh, and when you combine those wastes with, the, with high turnover, um, in the last couple of months, every facility that I've visited, at some point, when I ask them, you know, why are you interested in robots, at some point they say, I'm having trouble finding people, right? So, it, I've never seen it like this. Um, now granted, I'm pretty young, so <laughs> maybe some of you guys have seen this before, but this is new to me where people are saying, hey, you know, day after day I hire someone and they just don't even show up because they found a different job. The options are out there, right? And especially in dull jobs, if your entire job is to push a cart all day long and it's nothing more engaging than that and you find an opportunity that's even slightly better than that, I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? You have all the options you could want. So if you're a job seeker, the market right now is awesome. But if you're looking for employees, it's not that awesome. So what we're seeing is a lot of high turnover, especially in less skilled positions, like moving carts. Um, the cost of replacing a worker, so it's not about the hourly wage or the salary or whatever anymore, right? It's training, um, accepting that they're gonna make mistakes. There's that onboarding time, and that's typically, you know, two to two and a half times their annual salary. I rounded up from that one and a half. When that worker's entire job, pushing carts or something, is fundamentally non-value add, that really hurts, right? Because you're, you're spending all this money constantly retraining people, and their job isn't even part of your, your value add stream. So automating as much of this non-value add labor as you can serves as a buffer against this high turnover that we're seeing. Feel free to take a picture of this slide, because um, I don't really feel like reading this word for word, and I don't think that's exciting either. But obviously, if you can't alter your floor plan, mobile robots uh, may be a good <coughs> fit. Uh, especially if your floor is unpredictable, if you have lots of human traffic, if you have pallets, mobile workstations, mobile robots may be a good fit, because now you don't need to block off certain areas just for material to move. Um, if the scale of your operation doesn't let you wait on one person to move carts or just a handful of people to move carts, uh, automation is kind of a no-brainer. Whether that's an AGV or a mobile robot, um, it depends on your, uh, the dynamics of your shop floor. Uh, multiple vehicles can operate together, meaning not constrained by a track. Uh, and automatically finding the most efficient way to carry out many tasks uh, might be a good idea to explore. ROI, again, this is a bunch of numbers. We don't need to go all the way through this, uh, but we're finding that for a simple push cart job where one person pushing a cart is replaced by one mobile robot with a cart, uh, they tend to break even in less than one year, but they certainly can. Um, like I said, these tend to be a little more complex than a simple robot deployment because there's just so many plant-wide variables are just going to be a lot more than what you can constrain in a single area or process, right? But we're seeing pretty good success in breaking even in less than a year uh, in, in replacing a simple push cart job with a mobile robot. This is a comparison uh, of all the mobile robots. I highly encourage you to do your own research because mobile robots, uh, the technology is advancing very quickly. So this is the latest information I was able to find. Um, the only thing I want to point out here is that Omron Adept has been doing this for more than 17 years. Uh, so their software, particularly, is very, very mature. Uh, if you need more than one robot and your complexity rises exponentially, fleet management software is going to be the key to successfully deploying <coughs> mobile robots. Um, so that's all I wanted to point out. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I don't know all the specs. I believe the Omron's limit is a 5% grade, right? So 
obviously the flatter your floor, the better it's gonna be. Um, I don't think any offering is, I don't think any offering likes like a dirt road or gravel or anything. Uh, yeah, with the note that the flatter the better, the Adept can handle a 5% grade um, pretty well. Uh, and I'm not sure what the spec is on the other offerings. Good question though. In our facility, we have two, two things we transform out. One is a, a cart that has it's all, all pre-made with a tongue on it, a movable tongue. Mm -hmm. The other one is pallets. Okay. And I'm just curious, I didn't see any pallets in your, um, where everything was on the vehicle, not a towed cart. Okay, so let me scroll back and find a picture of that cart, and I'll point out some things. <coughs> okay, so this is the Omron with the car attachment, okay? One hassle with towing, uh, and the reason that the Adept doesn't, or sorry, the Omron doesn't support towing applications is that your turning radius gets a lot bigger when you're towing, so right? So you can't turn on a dime anymore. But we put four carts together, but okay. it's a very laborious task to make turns. Right now, we have a man who's talking about that's it all. And okay. the four carts, that fourth cart, depending on the driver, you run the other way because you're never sure yeah. where that fourth cart is going to go. And so, if you, especially if you have four cards, this is an issue with even one card, but especially with four cards, there's one thing that you can't do reliably. Exactly. So, the focus of the Omron is maneuverability, right? So, that's why we only do applications with top mounted payloads, especially in more cramped areas where you might not have a bunch of room to turn. Um, it's something, now every application is a little bit different. Maybe there's a solution, we'd love to talk to you about it, uh, but. Yeah, we, we, we put four carts together because we, we don't want to put any more people and buy another tugger. Sure. So from, from a utilizing a person standpoint, it doesn't pay to have less than four carts in your train because it, it takes that long to get, a, get everyone, get, a, get around the facility and. Sure. If they, if they were all moving independently, then maybe we wouldn't have to train them together. But see, we, yeah. we un unfortunately at our facility, we had a uh, unnamed competitor up there on your slide and with the uh, square cart that would hold a pallet. And um, yeah, that, that was a disaster. So yeah. if, if creek form makes modular benches and stuff, not what we found was they make modular benches, not, not ATVs. Sure. Um, I just want wondering because if we have a, a large investment in like the carts that we have, they, they move parts on racks from one side of the facility to the other. Right. And to, to handle those racks with parts on them is any more than we do now is going to be a, a quality nightmare because the, the, they're all finished parts, and um, I just wondered how you, you handle that. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't get into towing applications with this. Um, for, yeah, everything gets a little more complicated. A deployment has enough variables as it already does. When you add towing, you have that issue of, okay, now you can't back up, right? Now, if you need to bring the cart here, or leave the train here, you have to approach it a certain way because that might be yeah, the only way out. Typically, all of our pick and drop points are in the aisle. Yeah. You know, like the pallet carts have a three-sided frame, and yeah. you can they only load and unload the pallet from the one side. Sure. Basically, all the, uh, some forklifts will grab it from the other side, but it's not yeah. standard. Well, it sounds like you guys did the right thing, right? Like, especially with these, it's super, super, super important to thoroughly evaluate the application and know as many details as you can and then you know do a lot of testing you guys are going to get sick of me saying that but i'm going to be saying it a lot like evaluate your process thoroughly know as many of the details as you can and do as much testing as you can um, and that'll 
either prevent you from pursuing a solution that's not going to work or increase the chances of a pursued solution. Uh, increase the chances of success, right? Good points. Any other questions? Uh, well, thank you guys. Um, I believe we have a demo of a mobile robot system. Is it running right now or is that going to be later? Sure. Sure. I'm sorry? Can run. Yes, it's ready. Okay. Well, it's 940. We have 20 minutes. Uh, if you guys want to see our shop area, feel free to go check that out. Hang out for 20 minutes. Um, if you're in Everyone here is in track two, right? Because track one goes to one in the other training room. So the next thing will be 10 o'clock, quickly deploying a machine tending solution right back here. So see you guys then.